Let me pray one more time before we start. Father, in Jesus' name, we just ask you to come and by your spirit begin to show us different things from your word, God, from the truth that your word teaches us. Father, we come before you right now to open up our hearts for what you have to say. God, I pray that you take my words, that you flip them around in the air. God, you cause them to land on every heart and the mind of every person. God, your words, God, the things that you are speaking, that you are saying, Father, to bring healing and to create change. Father, we thank you for it. I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. Well, look, you can open up your Bibles up to the book of Psalms. If you've got like a paper Bible, crack it open in the middle somewhere and You'll probably end up in the right book, or if not, try it again, and you'll end up in the right book. The Book of Psalms, this collection of songs and uh, poems that have been written. It's kind of like the journal of men of God, mostly of um, the Bible hero David. You know, David and Goliath, it's that guy. He wrote a lot of these psalms. We're going to be looking at Psalm 91 this morning, but before I get there, I want to address our other audience, the Periscope audience. If you're watching this live on Periscope, thank you for joining us. Make sure you text us or tweet us or uh, give us a note on uh, Periscope there. Just make a comment that you're joining us so that we can, I don't know, include you in the number of people that are church with us on Sunday. But thank you for coming and or for watching and for um, uh, looking at this, even the cash version, thank you for doing that. You can find this on YouTube after. If you follow us on Facebook, you can also find this on Facebook. So if you miss anything, you can see my pretty face again, and you can fast forward to the place that you missed and get that thing. You know what's much easier is just text me and I'll send you the notes. But anyway, all kinds of all kinds of ways to do church, isn't that right? So thank you for joining us on Periscope. Hope you enjoy. Story is told of uh, the, uh, the devil sitting outside on the steps of a church and uh, you know the devil sitting outside on the steps of a church and he's sitting there and uh, he's got tears streaming down his cheeks and he's, he's really upset he's quite sad you know his countenance and somebody walks by and he says hey, what's, the, what's the matter and, uh, and the devil says they're blaming me for everything in there This is a joke, yeah. All right, praise God. The blame me for everything in there. How many of you ever kind of thought that Christians sort of do that? Sort of, you know, they, they make like a real dumb mistake and they'll say, yeah, the devil kind of made me do it, yeah? You know? Or how many of you, how many of you, you know, kind of know somebody that kind of like, you know, they, they kind of take the blame away from themselves and they say, you know what, it was the forces that was against me that made me do it. Is that right? You know, or, you know, just kind of like, eating bad, and then, you know, like, your immune system's kind of drained, and like, you know what, the enemy just made me sick. You know, how many of you, you know, I don't know, there's something about that that kind of like, we bristle against that, because we're like, Ugh. but we, so, we sort of do that ourselves, you know, in our private world, in our, you know, like, it, with some of our, some of our weaknesses, or some of our temptations, we'll be like, you know what, the pressure was just too great, <laughs> you know, and so I succumbed, you know, so we sort of blame the devil sometimes, you know, it's, it's funny to think about the enemy, the enemy of our souls being upset, because we're blaming way too much stuff on the enemy. Many Christians talk about, um, you know, the, 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 the enemy um, op op opposing you, you know, that the enemy is kind of coming against me right now in my life. And maybe, maybe if you're new to church or maybe you haven't heard this kind of talk, but a lot of Christians, you know, some Christians that I know, they'll, they'll talk about the enemy opposing them in their life, and there's certainly something about that. There's this idea of oppression, you know, so the enemy not just kind of like come in and stand against you wherever you're headed or where God wants you to go, but the idea of oppression that there's like a devil, because the Bible talks about devil, it's kind of actually kind of like, even like on you, kind of like on your shoulders, kind of like a weight or a heaviness. I don't know, maybe you've experienced that in your life or in your walk with God where you're feeling like, you know what, I'm oppressed by something here that's bigger than me, that's just my thoughts and my feelings and, and what's going on in my life. You know, even, you know, so, some Christians kind of wonder, and, and you know, the Bible certainly makes mention of this, that not only can an enemy oppose you spiritually, not only can an enemy kind of be on your life or like, kind of like weighing you down, but there's, there's such a thing called possession, where, where a demon actually, you know, kind of like, you know, in the same way that the Holy Ghost would possess you, that the enemy, there's, there's a way where the enemy can not just have a stronghold in your mind or just kind of oppress you, but can actually be in you. You know, that there's demonic possession. Isn't that right? I mean, like we know, we know of stories and, 
You know, um, in the Bible, certainly that's the case. You can see that. And so there's the opposition and there's the oppression and there's the, there's, the, there's, the, there's, the, there's something inside me speaking to me, making me do something, you know, which I think is probably far more prevalent than we, than we like to think. All these questions, you know, and all these ideas around our spiritual enemy can lead us to a lot of confusion about what spiritual warfare is. And I'm sure you've seen our brochure by this time. In the month of May, we're going to take a break from Mother's Day because I didn't want to talk about devils on Mother's Day. But we're going to take a break on Mother's Day. The rest of the month, we're going to be looking at spiritual warfare, exactly how it works. Like just some basics, right? Just some kind of like... Some, some, some simple understanding about how spiritual warfare works. We're going to kind of um, break that open today and begin to talk about it a lot. Um, that's going to be our next series for the month of May. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of find ourselves very often opposed or oppressed or even possessed by the enemy. Lots of questions. And I'm not declaring or speaking and saying that I know exactly how all this works. All I'm saying is I know what I want you to know. And that is some basics. That is some basic 101 Understanding reminders for many of us because we've walked in this for a while reminders about what the Bible says about our spiritual enemy One of my favorite speakers uh, Rodney Howard Brown. I used to listen to him a lot not so much Anymore, you know, but he would he would kind of wrestle with this question a little bit, you know um, How many of you know the, the the book title Frank Peretti? I believe the author is um, this present darkness Yeah and uh, Rodney is, is a great, it's a great novel. It really opens up your eyes to the potential um, activity of demonic forces. Like it really does. It opens up your eyes. Like wow, I never thought of it like that before. But you can get off in looking for a devil behind every bush, right? I mean, you can get off in that. You know, like so. There's a devil everywhere, and the devil's making me do everything, and, and the devil's you know the devil this and the devil that. And it's almost like we bring glory to the devil. <laughs> you know, um, <clears throat> I just remember some of the things that Rodney Howard Brown used to say. He used to talk about it. He used to, he used to say, you know, what about a book called This Present Glory? <laughs> you know, the fact that what God is doing in the earth is far greater than anything that the devil could drum up. You know, how about a book called This Present Glory? <laughs> he did this experiment in one of his meetings where he said, all right, everybody. Let's just stand up and begin to bless the Lord and bring glory to the Lord. You know, kind of like what we did earlier. Let's just stand up and begin to thank God and bring glory to the Lord, right? And you got a few, you know, you got a few Christians kind of standing up in their chairs and, yay, thank you, Jesus, you know, yay. And then sit back down again or whatever, you know, he would do this in his meetings, yeah. And uh, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes like, you know what? Sometimes we just got to get mad at the devil, you know, talking about how to address the enemy. You know, sometimes we just gotta, you know, we just gotta like put our foot down and fight. Yeah. And uh, he said, let's all do that together, everybody. Can we do that? Or whatever. And then everybody's like standing up to their feet. You know, and the volume and the activity and the passion in the room, you know, against the enemy. In contrast to the glory that was willingly given to the one who has wrought every victory we could ever need and ever want in our life. Listen, it is easy for us to get sidelined with some of this stuff, to get distracted by it. Isn't that right? Where we can be more passionate about things of the enemy than we are about the things of God. God forbid, not this church. <coughs> right? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Used to be a big question in Christian circles, and I'm sure some of, some of us still have it, you know. Can a devil possess a Christian? He used to spin it around and say this. I don't, I don't know what you're asking. He would say, can a Christian possess a devil is a better question. <laughs> we don't know a lot of how this works. We don't know a lot of the spiritual exchanges like that dynamic. Can a Christian possess a devil? There's errors and there's distractions. There's ditches on different sides, but we must have some of this down pat for ourselves that we know about it. Spiritual warfare tactics 101. Here are some basic guardrails for our discussions that we're going to land in Psalm 91 uh, this morning. Some basic understandings. And as I go through these this morning, there's only a few of them. As we go through them, I want you to think, okay, do I believe this? And if so, what am I doing about it? Right? Do I believe this? If so, what am I doing about it? 
we're going to jump into some basic assumptions, some guardrails for our discussions on spiritual warfare. You ready? This could shake things up a little bit, so look out. Number one. Guardrail number one, basic assumption number one is this. You are under attack. Uh-oh. Basic assumption number one. John Eldridge, one of my favorite authors, he says it this way. To be born into the world is to be born into a world at war. Just by being the here, you're under attack. Even more so by being someone that says, you know what, I'm interested in God or I want to follow God closely with my life. You and I, we are under attack. 1 Peter 5 verse 8, it says that your enemy is like a lion. Roaring, like roaming around, roaring, seeing whom he might devour. Your enemy is out there looking for a way to sneak up on you and have some lunch. To steal, to kill, and destroy from your life in John 10.10. That's what the enemy is all about. He's out to attack you. And so we have to start from this basic assumption. You know, I might not have thought much about it. I might have just, you know, been getting up in the morning and just trying to live my life the best way I know how and going to bed at night. You know, I'm just kind of raising a family. I'm not doing anything terribly bad. I'm just kind of like making the best with what I've been given in my life. Haven't thought much about it. Well, maybe it's time for you and me to think a little bit more about it. Because the Bible is very clear that the enemy, your enemy, my enemy, is out and about looking for whom he may devour. I just want to kind of um, highlight this a little bit by saying this. The Bible says, in Romans, in Romans chapter 14, it says the kingdom of God, the things that God wants to do, are not all the rules and regulations that we kind of think that church or Christianity or religion is about. It's not about any of that. That when you boil it all down, the kingdom of God, what God is trying to do on the earth, is about this. It's about my understanding of how righteous God has made me. It's about righteousness. Not doing everything right. Like, that's not how we got saved. But by Jesus doing everything for us and my understanding about what that does in me, the Bible says that I have become, you and I have become, if we believe in Jesus, the righteousness of God in Christ himself. Amen. And so it's the understanding of our righteousness, like the fact that we are as righteous as Jesus was, our revelation, <coughs> our understanding about that, that is the kingdom of God. It says the kingdom of God is our peace. It says it's righteousness Peace. In other words, no matter what happens, I'm not worried. I'm not bothered. All the hell can break loose around me, but I am at rest. I am at peace. How many of you think the enemy has stolen some of your peace of late? I know I could say, yeah. Peace. Complete calm on the inside because you know who God is. That's, that's the, the Bible says that's the kingdom of God in you. Is your understanding of how righteous you are? The fact that you are not worried because you know that everything's going to work out. And because you know that, the third thing that the Bible says the kingdom of God is, is this. Joy. That as you walk with God, get closer to God, there's something that increases in your life. This is an acid test right here. The joy in your life. The joy level gets greater and greater and greater and greater and greater. And it's not joy because everything's going so well out there in your life. It's joy because of who he is and because where you're headed and because what he's doing in you and through you in your life. This is the kingdom of God. Righteousness, my understanding of it. Peace, I'm not worried about my life at all. <coughs> and joy. I just got this, I got the giggles when I think about Jesus because of everything that, you know, it's just joy. Just joy, you know, pure joy. That's the kingdom of God. In the Holy Ghost. That's Romans 14, 17. The enemy comes to rip that out from your possession. If that would be like land that you're standing on, like territory that you're on, your righteousness, your peace, your joy. The enemy comes and gives you a push to try and get you to fall right off of the camera. <laughs> to fall, gives you a fall right off of the area that God has given you. The enemy comes to try and push you up, to, to get you right to the edge, and then to begin to doubt, and so that you're off, so that you're, ah, I'm really stressed out, I'm really worried, I've forgotten who I am and who God's made me. That's what the enemy wants to do, to get you right off, to write you, get you right off base. You and I are under attack. How many, when I put it in those terms, would you say, yeah, no, absolutely. 
Yeah, like my, my knowledge of who I am in God has been threatened. It's been challenged. I've, I've, been, I've been made to believe lies about that. I've, I've, I've thought less of myself than I should. I've kind of wallowed in my self-pity a little bit. I've been, yeah. I've been made to be buffeted by worry and fear and stress in my life. Well, absolutely. The enemy has stolen my joy. There are days when I just kind of like, why am I even living this life that I'm living? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's joy that's been stolen. How many of you would say, yeah, no, I'm under attack? Listen, this isn't just you and your slobby Christianity or your carelessness in the way that you live or your just the different, your emotional makeup and your, this isn't just you. This is the enemy coming to attack. You are under attack. Basic assumption, number one. You know, in different parts of the world, you can see the enemy, you can see the demonic um, flare up uh, way more vividly than you can see here in North America. Isn't that right? I mean, like some of the, some of the spiritual stuff that you see in other places and, and the spiritual warfare that's going on. It's easy to kind of come to a Canadian church, North American kind of place, Western world, and kind of like, man, there's no devils here. You know, this is all pretty relaxed, right? It's all pretty chill. <laughs> you know, it's, listen, it's a, it's a facade. There are... There are, there is demonic attack against you and me here in this part of the world just as vividly as there would be in other parts of the world. One guy said it this way, you know, the devils in North America are the ones that just couldn't make it over in Africa. You know, they're just kind of like, ah, and they just kind of like ship them out to Canada. <laughs> Tell you what, we are under just as much attack in the Western world as, as they are over there. Isn't that right? Come on now, it's true. The enemy plays in our flesh and our weaknesses with temptation. He, he waits for a moment of weakness and temptation, and then he moves. The enemy has playground in our thoughts. The Bible says that, that he fires thoughts at us. Did you know that? You're like, oh, man, I'm feeling really bad today. I'm feeling really sick today. You know? Man, I wonder if it's Zoma Zoma disease, you know, that I've been hearing about. And you're like, oh, I wonder. You know, and some of the thinking, some of the thoughts, we would say it's just our freestyle thinking. You know what? It's, the, it's demonic. It's the enemy. You got to understand that. The Bible talks about the thoughts that are fired at us. The enemy in our life, he comes against us with through, through closing doors that God wants to be open. And opening, opening doors and opportunities that no, God would actually not have us take that opportunity, right? So to open and close doors, the enemy can work through that in our life where certain situations line up. We're like, oh, it must be God. And God's kind of like, no, you should ask me because that's not really me. Is that right? Or a door closes and we're like, oh, oh I guess that's not God then. But yeah, God's like, no, no, it is. You need to bang on that door. You need to push that thing open. I'll be with you, right? So the enemy works in those ways in our lives. He works through our fear, our worry, our stress. All right, are you ready for this? Hashtag Facebook quotable. You ready? The Christian life only makes sense in the light of the fact that I am being spiritually opposed. You with me? Let me say it again. The Christian life only makes sense in the light of the fact that I am being spiritually opposed. If, I, if you and I try to follow Jesus, and we assume that it's just us and Jesus and there's no spiritual opposition, we will fall flat on our face over and over and over because we're under attack. All right, basic assumption number two. We need to know about it and act like it. Assumption number one, we're under attack. Assumption number two, guardrail of our discussions when it comes to spiritual warfare. We certainly need to know about it and act like it. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, if you want to jot that down, don't take a notes or come back to that. 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, For my brethren, this is a, a church planter writing to a church that he planted. He said, for my brethren, he called them his brethren. He said, so disciples, brethren, followers of the Lord, people in church, he says, we are not ignorant of his devices. What it says. We don't want to be ignorant of the devices of the enemy against us. That word devices means his scheming, his attacks against you. For you and I to know about the fact that we're in spiritual warfare and to act like it. Not being ignorant of the things that the enemy's trying to do. You know, in church work, I get to talk to a lot of different people about, you know, at least the surface or some level of detail about their lives and just kind of like, and after conversations, sometimes during conversations, I'm like, I can see what the enemy's trying to do right here. 
I can see. And the counsel of the Lord is there, you know, hopefully for me or any other person as they surface what God's saying, what God's doing. The counsel of the Lord is there, but you can see that, you know what, this is a, this is a scheme of the enemy. Are we even aware of it? Are we even, you know, if I was to ask you, you know, how does the enemy like to trip you up? Would you know, right? Would you, would you be able to identify the schemes or the attacks or the, the warfare that is against you? In Proverbs 24, I believe it is, it says, wage your own war. Because you're in one. So wage it. Fight. Yeah. We're going to look about how to do that. But I want to leave it at this for now. That we need to know about it and act like it. How many of you living in this city... Well, that's Calgary, maybe you would, but put yourself in another city. I don't know, Chicago or New York or Toronto or Forest Lawn or something. Put yourself in a different place and just be like, you know, how many of you would just kind of leave your front door just kind of like hanging open, like the screen door, just kind of like blowing in the wind and just kind of go away for a couple weeks? How many of you would do that? I mean, who knows about how much of your stuff would be left when you got back? Isn't that right? And yet we live our Christian lives so many times sort of unaware as if we weren't under attack. Yeah. And I'm not saying stress about it and worry about it and, and, you know, buy all the cameras so that you can see who's in your front door while you're on a beach in Hawaii and all that. I'm not saying do all that. I'm just saying get a lock, right, and lock it and be conscientious, you know, about your own security, about your own safety. Right, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about spiritual warfare, that there's a measure that I need to know about the fact I'm under attack and not leave my spiritual door kind of hanging wide open. Facebook quotable. Hashtag. There are areas of your life. You will not get victory in without addressing it spiritually. You hear me this morning? There are areas of your life and my life that we will not get victory in without addressing it spiritually. Without addressing the spiritual opposition. Without taking the time, taking the diligence to stand up against what the enemy's doing. And in the name of Jesus, and we're going to talk about how to do this, it's not hard. In the name of Jesus to say, no, not on my watch, in Jesus' name. There are things in our lives we won't get victory over without stepping out. So we need to know about it, and we need to act like it. I want to give you another basic assumption here this morning, and it's this. You get to win with his victory every time. Spiritual warfare basics, you're in a war. We need to act like it. Lastly, you get to win every time. Hear me out. Because a challenge is in your life, you get to beat it. The Bible is very clear about who wins. You get to beat it. Because a challenge is in your life, you get to beat it. Because some enemy shows up at your front door, you get to win. You get to keep him out. Because it's in the ring with you, you get to win. You get to have the final count. You get to win with his victory every time. In 1 John 3, 8, it says this. For this purpose, Jesus came where the Son of God was made manifest. You know what it says? For this purpose. For this singular sums up the entire work of Jesus. It says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest. That he would destroy the works of the devil. Jesus, he wins every time. You know what's neat about that? Is in Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to read there for a minute. We are still going to land in Psalm 91, so you can keep a finger in there. Keep there. I'm just going to read you something from Luke chapter 10. This is Jesus, the one who came to destroy every work of the enemy. This is partway through Jesus' ministry. You know he had 12 followers, 12 friends, 12 disciples, the Bible calls them. Right, and that, that, that served his ministry, and, and of course they were the ones that uh, provided leadership to the church um, after Jesus left. What's kind of a lesser known fact is that Jesus also trained up and raised up a group of 70, some um, translations say 72, uh, raised up 70 um, leaders, people that went out ahead of him into all the towns and all the regions that he was going to go and preach in and go and speak in their synagogues. And so you can see this here in Luke 10, verse 1. It says, After these things, the Lord Jesus, he appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. So when his ministry is picking up steam and, and picking up momentum. And he said to them, 
The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, and behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. All right, there's opposition. He gave him some instructions. Carry neither money bag or knapsack or saddles and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. And if not, it will return to you. He talked about some spiritual dynamics. He talked about how to stay in a place and how to minister there. In verse 9, he said, and heal the sick there. This was a trademark of the kingdom of God. If you're sick, you get healing when you come to Jesus. That's like, this is, this is what God, this is what Jesus is all about. He said, heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter, and he talked about when it doesn't go well and what to do about opposition. And then he um, issued some woes, some sort of condemnation among cities that he knew would turn these disciples of his away. <laughs> then in verse 17, there's this moment um, after this where all these followers of Jesus that have been sent out to do Jesus' work as lambs among wolves. They all come back um, to Jesus, and they're all kind of like this gathering, this kind of meeting place, this sort of conference. And it says, the 70 returned with joy. There's that joy right there, see? And it says, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Like we can go into a house, or we can pray for a person, and we can say, you go in Jesus' name. And they're subject to us. They have to leave. Says, even the demons, like we have spiritual authority over these devils and over these demons. And here's, here's what Jesus responded. He said, I saw like Satan fall like lightning. I saw Satan fall. If you know, if you know some of the scriptures um, in the Old Testament, it alludes to this, this, uh, this moment, this time um, in eternity past before the creation of the world. When Lucifer sinned, if you know some of the stories, he was like a, um, so I don't know some of the scriptures, he was like a, like the worship leader in heaven, as it were. And, he was, and, and when he um, sinned and rebelled against God, the Bible says that he was cast down to the earth. Um, and, and his angels with him, like a, a third of the angels with him, cast down to the earth. And it says, Jesus refers to it, he says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. It's almost as if, as the 70 were going out and they were laying hands and rebuking devils and, 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 and seeing that the enemy was subject to them in the name of Jesus, it's almost like every prayer that they prayed, Jesus was aware in the region of Satan falling like lightning from the heaven, that a stronghold was broken, that a, that a bondage was broken, that a life had been gained, and that Satan's dominion and his power over the region was breaking. And Jesus says this, he says, I give you the authority. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he would destroy the works of the devil. Listen, Jesus said, yeah, no, that's right, that's me. I destroy the works of the enemy. Behold, I give you that same authority to destroy the works of the enemy. He said, I, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, talking about different kinds of devils, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. They will be subject to you in my name, is what Jesus said. So you and I have confidence based on these scriptures and many others. We can say this, for this purpose was this Son of God manifest. That in his region of the world, in his time, in his generation, and with the things that God's called him to do, he would destroy the works of the enemy. Is that right? For this reason was this daughter of God manifest. For this reason was this son of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. For this reason were we brought forth. Did we come to be in our time and in our day. For what reason? That we would destroy the work of the enemy. Are you here this morning? That is our mandate. Listen, we get to destroy whatever the enemy is doing. He doesn't win. We win. Amen. Every time with his victory. I want to um, just kind of. Uh, outline this a little bit more by going to Ephesians 1 and 2 and then we'll land in Psalm 91 this morning. In Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, I mean, you could spend the rest of your life just studying these, this, this little page right here. I mean, this is, this is pretty incredible, full of all the stuff that Jesus has done for us. And it says this, Ephesians 1, verse 21, or verse 20. Christ was raised from the dead, the Bible says, and was seated at the right hand of God in heavenly places. Verse 21, far above all principality of power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. 
Jesus, and he was raised from the dead, was seated on high, and it makes special mention, far above all principality and power, far above all might and dominion and every name that is named. That means over the spiritual powers that be in your life. Over the spiritual opposition that has wrecked your family and caused, caused pain and, and confusion for generations. That's like over the spiritual strongholds, over this region that we're like called to minister to as a church. Over, over Calgary, over Canada, over North America. Like every power that can be named. Every principality of power that can be, named, can be named. Jesus was seated high above all of that. It goes on to say, and he put all things, God put all things under his feet. In other words, he has complete authority and complete dominion and victory over every demonic power, including the ones that harass you day in, day out. Mm -hmm. To which we would say, well, that's great for Jesus, but we're still down here. I want to show you something here. Drop down in chapter 2, verse 4. I'm going to back it up here to chapter 2, verse 2. He's talking about the pattern of this world that we used to walk in before we knew Jesus. It says, according to the course or the pattern of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's what the, that's what the, the devil is called in Scripture, the prince of the power of the air. The spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. In whom we also, we once conducted ourselves, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ by grace that we have been saved. Watch this, verse 6. And he has raised us up together. And he has made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So you also, you live down here. But in the spirit, you have a place that is with Christ in heavenly places. Far above Every principality, every power, every devil in hell, everything that's come to attack you or the people that you know and love, you have ultimate and complete authority over all that. Uh -huh. Isn't that awesome? Amen. So basic assumptions. It needs to include this. We don't fight from the position of I'm trying to get something. We fight from the position of we have ultimate authority, we have, we have the land and we have the territory, we are defending it against the enemy until his final judgment comes. You hear this morning? Amen. Basic assumptions. You're under attack. You need to know about it and act like it. You get to win with his victory every time. Let me say it this way. There is absolutely... No temptation, harassment, or ground taken by the enemy that you need to tolerate in your life. Are you here? There is absolutely no temptation, no harassment, or ground taken by the enemy that you need to tolerate in your life. Let's finish with Psalm 91 here this morning. In this entire series, I wanted us to walk away with um, with three things kind of in our spirit about spiritual warfare. Those guardrails, those basic assumptions kind of set the groundwork for it. Psalm 91, it introduces this first concept that I want us to, to kind of really carry away from this series, and it's this. That God wants us safe. When it comes to spiritual warfare, there is danger. There is danger in attack because it's war. When it comes to spiritual warfare, God wants us completely safe. And we can find this in Psalm 91. And I encourage you to make this as personal as you possibly can. And it goes like this. In Psalm 91, verse 1, it says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth will be your shield and buckler and you will not be 
afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes will you look and see the reward of the wicked. I'm going to drop down to verse 14. It says, because he, that's you and me, can set our love upon him. Therefore, God will deliver us and he will set us on high because we have known his name. We will call upon him and he will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us and honor us. And with long life, he will satisfy us and show us his salvation. Amen. We're going to springboard from this psalm. I'm just introducing it this morning. We're going to springboard from this into, into how God wants us saved. He wants us free. He wants us to be powerful for him when it comes to spiritual warfare. Here's how it starts. We start by acknowledging that we're in this war. We're going to do something about it. And that God has given us a place of protection. And it's with him. It's walking closely with him. This is what it means when it says he who dwells. The word means reclines or rests close to Jesus. Shall abide means I'm going to take up lodging there. I'm going to shield myself from this storm by being close to God. Shall abide under the shadow of the Lord. Here's where it's personal. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my strength and my, and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. I will say of the Lord. That's where it gets personal. We say all kinds of things about the, the terror, about all the fear, about all the worry, about the things that bug us. We say all kinds of things. Here's what we need to be saying right here. I will say of the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him shall I trust. Amen? Amen. 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 I want to share those things with you this morning because we are in a war and it matters, but we get to win. Amen. We're going to unpack that a little bit more next time we get together and talk about these things after Mother's Day. Praise God. When we all stand up, we're going to uh, close a prayer this morning. Let's go before the Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost, for what you can do here in this place this morning. God, thank you for your work in us. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God. Go ahead and close your eyes and just kind of lock yourself in with God for a moment. God, we love for your presence here this morning. God, we fed from your word and the things that you say. Oh, Spirit of God. Go ahead and get personal with God right now. I want you to think for a moment some of the opposition that you felt in your life. I'm telling you, it's more than just the unwise choices and the kind of the places that you feel that you put yourself in in life. It's more than that. You know, the struggles and the challenges that you face when it comes to your destiny and your future, when it comes to your peace and your joy. The struggles that you face, they're bigger than just the way you think about it and just you and just... It's bigger than you. There's an enemy that's come. Steal, kill, destroy. Makes sense, doesn't it? But Jesus has come to give you life and life more abundantly. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. This is how to make the devils begin to flee right here. This is how to make the opposition begin to to dissolve, begin to evaporate. God, I'm just going to get really, really close with you. God, you are my refuge. From that thing, I can't seem to kick. And from that attack that comes my way when I hear about this, or when I see that. God, I hide myself in you right now. Can, you, can we do this together as a church? Just go ahead and take a minute and hide yourself in God. The Bible says that you can be dwell, you can dwell, you can abide with God. That means it's not just a church thing, but it's a Monday through Saturday thing where you are walking with God close to God. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we press into you. We press into you, God. 
We get really, really close to you right now, Jesus. God, we want to live. We want to walk with you. That's where it starts. Being aware of this thing, that's where it starts. Get really, really close to your heart. Take your problems there. Take the storms of your life there. Take your temptations there. Oh, God, right in your presence. Right in your presence. Father, I thank you for it. Father, I believe you right now for a supernatural opening over us. And God, we're able to press right into you. God, even as we're walking out of this place this afternoon and into the week, that God, we're aware of your presence, that we're close to you. For we will say of you, Lord, that you are our refuge, and our fortress. In him alone do I trust. You know, the imagery here is there's a storm, there's wind, there's a biting rain, and you're out in the storm. But God is your refuge. And to run into the refuge, you step inside. And there's quiet and peace and warmth. And the harassment is over. I declare and I speak over you that that opening is there in the spirit right now. For you to find your refuge in God. For you to run from the storm of your confusion and you're not knowing how to live and you're not knowing what to do about the things that dog you and plague you, that you can run into the refuge that is Jesus. Father, I thank you for that this morning, that you come and you do that in us right now. There's a spiritual thing happening, that's why you can hear it in different places in the room. There's a spiritual thing going on. So, Father, I thank you right now for that opening in the spirit that we get to be with you like that. That we get to make you our home. For you are our refuge. Father, I thank you for it. That from that place, all kinds of victory come. All kinds of peace come. You remind us of who we are. And how powerful you've made us. Father, I thank you for it. In this place. And in Jesus' name. You know, I'm going to dismiss the service here. But I really feel by the spirit. Just to pray against some stuff that's been opposing you. If you felt spiritual opposition in your life, maybe it's a temptation, maybe it's a, a discouragement or a fear of some kind, that a sickness even that just kind of comes against you and, and pushes against you. If you feel that this morning, I just feel it on me to fight over you with the victory of Jesus. Because all things are under his feet. If you feel that this morning, if you feel a weight on you, you feel like, you know what, I've just been attacked. I see it now, I've just been attacked. I want to join my faith together with you. For that. So if you're open to it, if you want that, you feel, yeah, you know what, that's me. Feel free to come on up to the front. Just kind of stand here just like this, and I'll just kind of get in front of you, and I'll just pray about that. So if you want that this morning for anything at all, then we can pray together to see the enemy flee. In Jesus' name. Of course, you can get that victory. You can stand and have your freedom yourself. I bless you in that. I hope this has ministered to you this morning. Thanks for being in church. Let's have a great afternoon. Hallelujah.